You're listening to Puma Podcast. Hi, I'm Marco Azurin, Puma Podcast for Teka Teka News. As the new year unfolds, many companies embark on a new season of recruitment thanks to fresh hiring budgets. Yet, the real challenge lies not just in finding the right talent, but in ensuring they stay and thrive within the organization. This subject is among the topics discussed by Haraya Coaching's Jen Horn and Puma Podcast CEO Carl Javier in the Imaginable Workplace Podcast, the podcast that explores various issues about work to help organizations willing to transform their systems. For today's Teka Teka News feature, we'll share a snippet of their conversation with Pam Baluyo, the founder and CEO of Scale Experts. Since 2018, Pam has been continuously honing her company's onboarding process to ensure high employee engagement and retention. So before we go into the details of what a good process for onboarding might look like and understand why it matters, I want to ask you, Jackie, what does some of the research say about onboarding? Let's clarify what we mean by onboarding. What that refers to is the process of integrating new hires into an organization so that they begin to perform their roles effectively as soon as possible. And this process can include new hire orientation sessions, introducing them to the organization's vision, mission, values, structure, culture, getting acquainted with the policies and procedures of the company, and even being introduced to colleagues the person will be working with. If designed and implemented effectively, an onboarding can also help new hires gain that confidence, and build the relationships they need at work to set them up for success in their new roles. But why does that even matter? According to a 2019 Gallup paper, employees are three times more likely to say that they have the best possible job when they've experienced an exceptional onboarding program. And that can also lead to higher job satisfaction, commitment, and performance, or even reduced turnover. So I think it's easy to underestimate the importance of onboarding, especially when you're a company that's rushing to hire. You got to pull people in. But I really appreciate that this can be a powerful way to build a company from the get-go as people transition from being interviewed to being a part of the team. So let's hear from one business leader on why giving onboarding attention matters to her. It's really crucial because I think what leaders uh, miss most of the time is how important retaining talent is. And through onboarding, you'll be able to determine which employees would last or which employees would um, stay with you or not. If at the very beginning, you've already set your expectations, like this is what the company is, this is what you're going to expect, this is the culture that you're going to enter into. If you are a good fit, you'll last. You'll be able to, you'll be able to enjoy the ride for as long as, as you can. And I'm really proud of that because I have, I mean, not all companies have that number of people that can stay with them for more than five years. And I have people who've been with me at the very beginning I started the company and they're still with me. And you've seen them grow. You must have done something right in your your process that made them stay. That was Pam Baluyo, founder and CEO of Scale Experts. They're a small to medium-sized business process outsourcing company that's been around since 2018. What this makes me think of is, often, we think we hire someone and great, they're on the team. But actually, there's this gap between being able to do your job, what you were hired for, and being a member of the team. Yeah, companies spend a lot of money and resources on recruitment. 
you know, like paying for job ads or headhunters and conducting a lot of interviews, which takes time and money, right? And then once they hire the person, what they might overlook is the value of having that proper onboarding process, which leaves an employee to fend for themselves. So you hear phrases like thrown in the deep end, sink or swim, hit the ground running, or sabak agad without giving them the understanding, the tools, or the support to do well. So from the same Gallup report I mentioned earlier, they also mentioned that only 29% of new hires will say that they feel prepared and supported to excel after experiencing onboarding in their organization. That means the 71% remaining are likely to feel uncomfortable, confused, or even dejected. On the other hand, there's a 2023 article on Harvard Business Review that says that if employees did have a good onboarding experience, 51% of them will say they would go above and beyond in their work. So it only makes sense to invest that time, right, in a, in a good onboarding program. How are these studies landing with you, Carl? So, as you all know, major weird yung work background ko. Like I've sort of been a hired hand at writing and all of these things. And I've not really thought that much about being onboarded. But now that I'm on the other end of this and I'm building a company, it becomes so clear that there's this huge gap that is a blind spot for me and, and probably for a good number of people where... You hire someone because they make sense on paper. You see their background and you go, this person, this person is going to work on my team. And it's almost like when you see sports trades and like a great player gets acquired by a team and everyone's going to go, that person's going to be a champion. And for some reason, it doesn't really happen because they don't get properly integrated onto the team. They don't learn the team systems or so on. We love Ted Lasso, so you can think of like Zava. Um, <laughs> yeah, what what I'm hearing from what you just shared is the value of integration. And it's not just about being fit for the job, but being fit for the culture, the team dynamics, and having a sense of belonging, right? Human beings are truly wired for connection. And how we can harness that is by creating an environment of psychological safety, which we talked about actually in the first season of um, this podcast, right? From episode three, I remember um, on the topic of safe spaces to grow, where our guests Dr. Joy Calieja, Cecilia Shriver, talked about the value of psychological safety. They shared how creating the conditions for a brave and safe space to learn, even from making mistakes and to ask for help when needed, all of these support a sense of belonging and growth. Moving from our conversation about integrating and becoming a part of a team, what does an onboarding process that creates belonging and a sense of safety to take risks look like? The first one is really to be transparent to them, what's in, what's in it for them. At the very beginning of scale experts, there's already a code of conduct or the conduct in the workplace, as we call it. This is sort of like the roadmap for them to understand how the process works. And in the course of having that, we have what you call a new employee orientation wherein they would now understand this is the culture, this is the the framework, and this is how scale expert look like. It's nice because the thing here is that those who really understood what the company is, what the company culture is, they're the ones imparting that. It's just a matter of like the the managers themselves, the co-work, hey, that's not what you're going to do. That's not it it doesn't work with us. Like, for example, if they're doing something in like chat, oh, you message everyone if you're going on a break. It's a matter of like, this is the culture that we wanted to have. If you wanted to feel more comfortable in the the workplace, this is 
this is what you can do. And, and if you need help, this is what you should do so that you won't feel lost. And in spite of, you know, us uh, working from home, it's amazing how you would see them at our gatherings, Christmas party, na nag, nagbibiruan, as if they've, they've been together in the workplace for far too long. And I, I guess it, Again, it contributed to the fact that when we did the onboarding early on, the transparency is there. If you're not comfortable, let us know before we even proceed. I really love what Pam is referring to here, which is to articulate and be clear about expected behaviors right from the start. And the way to know you've done a good job of clarifying those expectations is if the employees themselves are the ones consistently pointing out how things are done around here. I don't know if that's something that you've seen in in your org too, Carl. I think with all of the experiences that I've had, it becomes a question of culture and hmm. how do you learn that culture? But that's that's what onboarding really is, is... How do you learn it? And it's not just when the HR person sits you in front of a PowerPoint and walks you through what the values and mission and stuff are. It's when you're going to go get a coffee, what does that look like? What does that feel like? How? What kinds of things do people talk about if and when you all hang out? We wanted to have that kind of environment where people are not too scared. So what we we integrate there is telling, this is what you do, um, and then people can come in the place of help. Like if you are new, um, you'll feel that you have those people around you to help you out and not feel alienated. There was this one instance with with a new agent uh, who's just been regularized. That the feedback she gave me, she'd never felt that she belonged because in previous companies they couldn't even see where the CEO was. Because either the CEOs or the senior executive managers were, were just figureheads na they can only probably just say hi at the most. But in, in my case, that they'll be able to actually talk and like ask questions and even like, you know, um, is there a way that we can, you know, um, you could help me with this or help me with that? There are even instances because parang like means they would announce looking for the IV and would say na they need help with the password and ako mismo that were like uh, what can you, what how can I help you with? That's how they'll feel na the, the the gap between you know the management or executive team being able to reach out to rank and file employees. I think it's great to have leaders like Pam who really live out their values through example. If a leader herself is offering to help a new employee with a seemingly simple query, it sets a real tone for a supportive culture, right? Yeah, I was thinking about how we were uh, discussing power distance in, in our previous episodes and and how the ability of employees to be able to approach senior management, CEOs, that's that's actually something that is special and that should be cultivated. When we set up those onboardings, we're able to communicate what options there are in how we can talk to people. Um, I'm, th- this is sort of a, a thing for us at Puma Podcast, but who gets called sir is a little weird and kind of deciding because... In, in the Philippines, you kind of just default that if somebody's, somebody's older, sir or ma'am or miss or something na sila, ganyan. I would say that it's much easier to relate when you hang back and then you kind of eavesdrop on people and see how they call you know, their superiors. I guess that's one of the things that I, I do miss is being able to observe how people view and interact with each other in person. So... I'm going to use this as a chance to go back to Pam and see how they're handling these challenges of relating with each other when they're working from home. The one thing that definitely had improved is that if you are hired by the company, everyone will know that you were hired because we will announce it on our portals, announce it on Facebook, announce it on 
on the channels that we have that, hey, we have new people on board and everyone would send in their welcome. And then over the years, we have improved with the way we, you know, we send out that they're welcome by sending out welcome kits, letting them know that, hey, you they welcome to the family. Here, here's a welcome kit to start you with. They usually receive like a, a headset and then a mug and then uh, a welcome note. Usually, we also have like notebooks. Kasi sabi namin, what do they really need? And most of them, chatagang scream, headset po! Like, and and di ba, some companies are just like issuing it. And if you're over with your employment, you have to return. Sa kanila hindi. So if you had your headset for two years now, that's yours. We won't be asking you to return it. We utilize the tools a lot. So... Um, we have Google tools to be able to work with, create rooms wherein we have a room that's just purely meant for breaks. The breaks would be like having my first break, break in 30 minutes, something like that. And then there are some in our staff room, we call it staff room, especially with the support staff room because they just recently went a leadership boot camp that they start the day with a gratitude post. What are you thankful for? And then for your staff, the HR team uh, came up with Trivia Wednesday or Code Monday, something like that. Something to look forward to. And the other thing that we you know, implemented, like this recent Mother and Father's Day, sending out Gcash with them with the condition that they're going to they're gonna spend it with their kids and then they're going to post it. Or how does your family matter to you? Whether you're a probationary employee or just came in a week ago, if you're a mom or dad, you receive that. We have our singles too. We have our, you know, our Women's Month. We feature our women for that. I, I think that that kind of inclusion helps them feel that okay, this is something. This is a this is a company different from you know the rest. What a great example of uh, listening to the needs of employees in, in the story that Pam shared. I think that's such a critical success factor to any onboarding. It isn't just one way. It can definitely be a co-created process. What this shows is how they as a culture and a, and a company function. And so one of the takeaways that I kind of want to bring for our listeners is you don't have to do specifically those things, but you have to figure out what works for your team. Most people imagine onboarding to be a one-way process. Usually the downloading of information from HR to the new employee. But actually, onboarding can and should be a two-way process. Pam shares an example of this here. Well, definitely, we would say that the onboarding process is a success if early on there is, you know, a check for understanding. Before, because you just convey, oh, this is our code of conduct, the usual stuff, blah, 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 without getting back to the employee and ask them, have you even understood any one of that? Because if they're not aware of it and then things go awry and they would like, oh, because I haven't really learned about that. So every time we get that kind of feedback, I always go back to the people who started the onboarding. What happened here? Bakit hindi daw niya alam? So that kind of feedback is something that helps the onboarding team, the, the recruitment team, even with the business development team. So five years before and five years now, the, the process had improved a lot. Because the feedback system was effective for us to know what, what's missing. So, so there. Especially in an onboarding process, when one is new and you're just starting out, you are likely to make a lot of mistakes. You're likely to stumble along the way. And so giving someone timely feedback, nurturing feedback, so that they understand how things are done here can go a long, long way. And, and that's what I'm appreciating about what Pam shared. It's, it's an understanding that people need that runway when they start out. And we can't expect that they'll get everything right 
right away? I'll, I'll share. One of the things that I like to do when I'm involved in someone's onboarding, so actually sometimes I challenge new new hires, new team members. Like instead of having that one day lecture format, they have to approach each of the team heads to get a briefing from how that team head does it. And that breaks some of the, here, I'm not ready to talk to people. It's like, no, that's part of your onboarding. And then next is, for example, it's a, I, we're onboarding like a social media person. I ask them, what's missing in our strategy? And, and that shows them that they're a part of the team that can have impact. And I think that's a, a powerful way to bring someone on board and to communicate with them that they, they matter. Like they're here because we believe in them. Oh, I love that. I love that example. I think what you're saying is that this person who might be feeling, you know, a little bit of pressure because they're new and want to contribute, you're giving them a good chance to actually exhibit where and how they can contribute right away, right? Because having this new person lens can be so valuable to any org, right? Or, or even just ask questions about why do we do things this way? Why is this process designed this way? That in itself can be so powerful. And it also gives them that confidence that they need to set them up for success. I love that. So good. Be sure to catch the full conversation on the importance of the onboarding process by searching The Imaginable Workplace on your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening to Teka Teka. Again, I'm Marco Azurin, Puma Podcast. Today's episode was produced by myself and put together by Joe Salcedo. The Imaginable Workplace is brought to you by Haraya Coaching, a company that supports individuals and teams by creating safe spaces for transformation, in partnership with Puma Podcast. The episode where we got this snippet was produced and written by Macy Hoven and Jen Horn, with Carl Syatt as editor. Thanks for listening.